take the beautiful seriously in the work of evangelization. Just last week, I had the great privilege of being at uh, Benedictine College in Atchison, Kansas. I gave the commencement address there to the graduating class. And also while I was there, I got this uh, wonderful award from the um, Institute on Beauty and Culture, which is run by my good friend, Dr. Dennis McNamara. He and I were colleagues for years at, at Mundelein. Um, but they asked me just to reflect a little bit on beauty and the role that beauty has played in my own formation. So I gave a, a more or less off the cuff uh, set of remarks, but I want to share some of that with you, just my own relationship with the beautiful. And I, I told them that, you know, go back to when I was a kid, I loved sports. My whole life was sports. It was baseball, basketball, football. If I read, it was reading about sports. So that dominated my life till I was probably 12 or 13. And then many times I've told you the story of uh, when I was 14 and the breakthrough I had in, in hearing about Thomas Aquinas and how that opened up my mind in a very fresh way. But I then began to have some experiences that were more related to the beautiful. And I want to share some of those. When I was a freshman at the University of Notre Dame, so I was there for one year before I entered the college seminary, I took a class um, that was in this big auditorium. It's, it's probably gone now, or I don't know, maybe replaced by another one. But it was a big auditorium at Notre Dame. And one of those classes that probably all the freshmen took, it was in the history of art. And it was taught by this marvelous professor named Robert Leder, and he's gone to the Lord since then. But um, at the time, I was 18, I thought he was this ancient old man. I've discovered after doing some research, he was about 10 years younger than I am now when he was teaching me. But Leder was himself quite a fine artist, a painter. But above all, he was an art historian and a teacher of art. Now, these are all pre-internet days, so there was a um, slide projector he had. And he had these gorgeous photographs that he himself had taken on his wanderings around the world, and they were just beautifully colored, richly textured photographs. So he would lecture to us, then he'd lower the lights. He began to show the great works of art. He loved them all, but it was really clear to me that he had a very special love for the art of the Middle Ages, and especially those marvelous Gothic cathedrals. If you want to know where my love for the Gothic world came from, it started really with Thomas Aquinas intellectually, but then Robert Leder showing these, these tremendous photographs of you know, the rose window at Notre Dame and the flying buttresses and, and this, the, the way the architecture made sense logically and all of that. He communicated it so powerfully. They'll tell you a story. Uh, there I am, this 18-year-old Irish kid, and you know, we Irish basically repress our emotions for many years, then we die. You know, that's, that's the way Irish deal with their emotions. But I'm out there, this 18-year-old kid in the dark, as he's showing these images from Chartres and Notre Dame and Amiens, Reims, and I'm, I'm weeping. Happily, it was in the dark, no one saw me. But it was the first time I think I really had a powerful subjective response to something that is objectively beautiful. Um, you want to know why when I got to Paris, I went right away to look at the North Rose window. It was because of Robert Leder. It was because of that class many years before. And I think I've told you that story. I, I was riveted to that window so totally that I went back every single day thereafter and looked at it. It has this transformative impact on you. That all started, I think, with Robert Leder, and that was my first really powerful subjective response to the objectively beautiful. I'll tell you a second story that's kind of goofy in a way, but I think it, was, it would have been, what, two years later. I was in the... Um, Baselin program at Catholic University, studying for my master's in philosophy. So I was about 20 or 21. And I'm in Washington. I'd been there before as a little kid with my family when I was like 13 or so. Um, but now I was living in Washington. And my friends and I went down to the mall. And we were right next to the Capitol, right almost on top of it. And I remember distinctly, as I looked at it, I just started to jump up and down <laughs> with what I can only describe as a kind of exaltation. It's like my whole body was responding to this beauty and harmony and order that I saw in front of me. I probably couldn't have articulated it then. I wouldn't have talked about 
as Aquinas does, wholeness, harmony, and radiance, but all three are present in something like the Capitol Dome. But my body knew it, right? My body understood how powerful that was, and it responded in the way that a 21-year-old can, you know, by jumping up and down. Here's a third one, not in regard to the visual arts this time, but to the aural arts, the art you can hear. I did my pre-priesthood retreat, 1986, so in advance of ordination, you have to go on a week's retreat. And I did it at St. Meinrad, Arch Abbey, which is nestled way down in the southern tip of Indiana. I remember driving, it's about a seven-hour drive from Chicago, and I got there at night, made my way to the guest house, so I slept through the night, and then up, up early, like 5.30 or something, to pray with the monks. And I remember vividly making my way through the kind of misty morning, not quite sure where I was going, I come up to the Abbey Church. I remember opening the side door and first being struck by the, the golden light inside. But what really bowled me over was the chanting of the monks. You know, maybe I'd heard that kind of chanting on, on a record before, but I had never heard that live. You know, liturgical music when I was coming of age was basically people playing four chord folk songs poorly on the guitar. And so to hear these ancient chants in all of their depth and harmony and aching prayerfulness. I don't know, it's like a door opened in my soul that day, which, thank God, has never shut. It was a door to the deep place of prayer. And to this day, no joking, whenever I pray, I kind of conjure that moment, remembering those monks, that's 30, what, six years ago, the beautiful, found its way through my ears this time into my heart and into my soul. That's how it works. Three stories. I could tell you many more. You probably have similar ones. Here's my overall point, everybody, is do not subjectivize and therefore relativize the beautiful. The beautiful is as objective as the good and the true. If I grasp the truth of a mathematical equation, well, that's true whether I like it or not. If I understand the goodness of a moral act, well, that's good whether I'm in favor of it or not. My subjectivity doesn't determine the thing. Rather, the objectivity of that value stops me in my tracks and works its way into my soul and reorders me. The same is true of the beautiful. Those three examples I gave. So weeping as I looked up at these, at these slides of these gorgeous medieval buildings, jumping up and down in front of the U.S. Capitol, and then having this door in my soul open up at St. Meinrad, that's what the objectively beautiful does to you. And you know, I'm a John Henry Newman man. Uh, when it comes to assent, arguments have something to do with it. And I'm, I'm a man of argument. I've made a lot of arguments you know, in, in these YouTube forums. But it's much more than that. Often we're moved to assent by things that we can't as clearly articulate. Things related to the beautiful, for example. So anyway, I wanted to share that with you. That's what I share with the folks up in uh, Atchison. But it's maybe my small way of saying, take the beautiful seriously in the work of evangelization. Mm -hmm.